This is Suck It Up, a Croft and Tabby short, book three, written by Brad Magnarella, narrated by James Patrick Cronin. Chapter One I stood my rolling suitcase on its end, leaned my walking cane against it, and knocked tentatively on Kayla's apartment door. As I switched the pet carrier to my other hand, Tabitha groaned in annoyance. I didn't forget. I preempted her. Then what in the hell are we doing here? We had this conversation on the walkover. I was too busy trying to keep from getting motion sick all over myself to hear whatever you were going on about. I sighed. I didn't forget. I just didn't see the notice. My cat squeezed around inside the carrier until her green eyes flashed accusingly through the mesh door. Yes, darling, because your mail pile is big enough to hide a body under. She wasn't wrong. I'd gotten in the habit of tossing my mail on the dining room table, every intention of opening it later, only to bury it in more mail. I vaguely remembered a postcard-sized announcement about a fumigation scheduled for the building, something to do with rats on the lower levels, but it wasn't until my apartment manager banged on the door at 10 that morning that I understood the fumigation was this weekend and I was supposed to have cleared out an hour earlier. Just look at it as an unplanned vacation, I said, growing antsy as I knocked again. Was Kayla even home? I would have called, but my line was dead. I imagined the overdue phone bill in the aforementioned pile. A vacation, she repeated flatly. With her? Would you rather huff toxic fumes for the next two days? I'm very tempted, darling. She annoys me. Everyone annoys you, I reminded her. Well, she's a special case, with all her babbling about her mystical insights and intuitions. She's been surprisingly accurate, I pointed out, though I still couldn't figure out how, given that she was mortal through and through. But our last case, with the Babaroga, hadn't been a fluke. And that grating voice, Tabitha continued, Ugh. Hey, I said quietly, we're not exactly bursting with options here. She's the only one in the city who knows you can talk. And I didn't trust my cat to keep her mouth shut for 48 minutes, much less hours. Well, why can't we go somewhere nice, she pouted, like the Ritz-Carlton. I looked down the flaps of my burned coat, past the frayed pants cuffs to my scuffed shoes. Sounds great, I said with a snort. Are you paying this time? Magic is wasted on you, she muttered. Though I shook my head dismissively, I was going to have to start considering other lodgings. Kayla wasn't home, and Manhattan's lower-end hotels were only slightly less dangerous than its supernatural streets after dark. I was raising my fist for a final futile knock when the door creaked open. I blinked in surprise at the young woman standing in the shadow of the doorway. She looked like she'd been run over by a truck and resurrected as a zombie. Her ratty shirt and pants were torn, and the half of her face not hidden by a curtain of black hair was smudged with what looked like engine grease. She stared at me blearily. Uh, I'm sorry, I stammered. I was looking for Kayla. I leaned back to make sure I had the right apartment number. In a voice croaky with sleep, she said, It's me, Everson. Entree. I hesitated for a moment, but when she backed inside and waved for me to follow, I saw it was Kayla. What I'd mistaken for Grease was a copious amount of dark makeup she'd apparently slept in. I couldn't account for the rest of her look, including the aggressive lip piercing. What had happened to the hippie chick? I'm sorry to just show up like this, I said, edging in sideways with my suitcase and Tabitha's pet carrier. They're fumigating my apartment and I was hoping we could crash for a couple nights. It's cool, she said, locking the door as I stepped into her cramped living room. I dreamt you'd come. Oh, yeah? I said, not entirely surprised. But instead of elaborating, she collapsed sideways onto a love seat and slung an arm across her eyes. Just make yourself at home. Help yourself to whatever's in the fridge. She flicked her wrist toward the kitchenette. I'd offer you a bed, but they're all taken. I hope you don't mind the other couch. Sure, sure, this is fine, I said, sizing up the stained cushions. I'd been to Kayla's apartment a month earlier, but it hadn't looked like this. 
Gone were the colorful throw blankets, candles, and prayer flags, along with the crystal displays, dangling dream catchers, and books on feminine wisdom and nature magic. In their places were cast-off clothes, plates of half-eaten food, and walls of posters that featured scary-looking singers in screaming poses. A mist of stale cigarette smoke smothered whatever remained of her mystical-smelling incense. And then there was Kayla herself. Is everything... All right, I asked carefully. I relocated a coffee mug crammed with cigarette butts from the couch and opened the door to Tabitha's pet carrier. She emerged, cautiously, no doubt as perplexed by Kayla's transformation as I was. Everything's cool, she croaked from behind her arm. My old roommates moved out and I took in some new ones. Hardcore punks. I've been wanting to explore my shadow half and I took it as a sign. We went clubbing in the East Village last night. Didn't get home till five this morning. I flinched at her mention of the East Village, the epicenter of New York's resurrected punk scene. The burned-out neighborhood was also home to some serious baddies. You couldn't walk a block without attracting a dozen soul eaters. Worse, ghouls were rumored to have been climbing up from a defunct subway line. And then there was the human element, which could be as nasty as any supernatural. I hope you took a cab, I said. Yeah, probably, Kayla murmured, sinking back to sleep. I got up and straightened a blanket over her, encouraged to see the protective amulet I'd given her still hanging around her neck. With nothing else to do, I collected the dirty dishes, carried them into the kitchen, and wedged them into a crowded sink that was disgusting even by my standards. I'd just finished emptying the mug-turned ashtray when Tabitha motioned me over with her head. What's up? I whispered. Not that I care, she said, but she's not right. I followed my cat's gaze to my friend's sprawled out form. Yeah, I noticed. She's a pathetic wreck, yes, Tabitha said impatiently, arranging her body in a way that claimed half our couch. But I'm not talking about that. As a succubus, Tabitha could perceive on several planes but God forbid she just say so. I opened my wizard's senses, soon picking up what she meant. Kayla's colors were different, but I couldn't quite put my finger on how. Not faded, but flat. Off, in any case, and in a way I'd never observed before. What's wrong with her? I whispered. Tabitha snorted. How much time do you have? Can you just give me a straight answer for once? You're lucky I decided to say anything at all. But, she released a massive yawn that sounded fake, really drawing it out. If I had to guess. She smacked her mouth several times, something else she knew grated on my nerves. I'd say something's been snacking on her. Great, another feeder, I muttered. The amulet would have warded away minor soul eaters, but vampires were another story. The idea of one preying on Kayla made me sick with anger. Fear, too. I tried to make a habit of not antagonizing the city's most lethal bloodsuckers, but I was getting ahead of myself. I checked the soft skin along Kayla's neck. No punctures, and her pulse felt strong enough. I inspected her wrists and ankles. Some feeders preferred them, but they all looked fine. I was replacing the blanket over Kayla's feet and considering how to proceed when a sudden voice made me jump. Hey, what the hell do you think you're doing? I wheeled in time to see a ridiculously tall man with blonde spikes rushing at me with a cocked aluminum bat. Chapter 2 Whoa, easy there, I shouted, backing away. I'm a friend of... He grimaced into a swing, the mist sending a gust of air against my face. My next backward step had me teetering against the coffee table. I didn't want to reveal my abilities, but I didn't want to get brained either. As he gathered his rangy body for another swing, I whispered, Respingere. Ambient energy gathered in the aluminum bat and detonated with a pop of light. He released his weapon with a startled cry and crashed into a standing lamp, both toppling to the floor. His first attempt to flail upright was unsuccessful. Don't go anywhere, he panted, even though I was holding the bat now. His struggle to untangle the lamp's cord from his leg further undermined his threat level. If you would have let me explain before you went full Daryl Strawberry, I said. 
Kayla and I are friends. I've never seen you before. Well, that settles it, I snorted. What more proof do you need? And I just caught you fetishizing her feet while she was sacked out. Fetishizing her? I reset my jaw. I was looking for something. Between her toes? Using the lamp as a crutch, he made it partway up before the lamp slid out from under him. Grunting, he splayed back down. Man, and I thought I had coordination issues. Stay right there, he warned again. You do realize I could have brought this down on your head multiple times by now. When that got nothing, I sighed and nudged Kayla with the blunt end of the baseball bat. She croaked in protest before lifting her squinting face. Oh, this is one of the roommates I was telling you about. Everson Flick, Flick Everson. He's going to be staying here for a couple. The last words crumbled to a murmur as her head sagged back to the couch. Satisfied? I said, lowering the bat and extending my hand in a reluctant peace offering. Flick finally gained his feet, swearing to himself when he noticed pieces of bulb on the floor. To his credit, he gave my hand a cursory shake. He looked older up close, the beginnings of crow's feet bracketing his bulging eyes, but I was more preoccupied with the lingering sensation of his grip, ice cold and carrying a familiar buzz, something I'd felt around chronic amphetamine users. And vampires. For the first time, he seemed to notice my suitcase as well as the large ginger mound on the couch staring back at him in utter disdain. Do you think you're moving in or something? He asked me. Territorial. Another vampiric trait. Just for the weekend, I replied, watching his reaction. Though his bulbous eyes made him appear more clownish than menacing, there was an unsettling glint of ownership in them as they cut toward Kayla. Out of caution, I traded the bat for my cane. Is that a problem? I pressed. He studied me for a long, disparaging moment. Finally, he snorted and sauntered back down the corridor. I waited for him to duck into his room, the door closing behind him before relaxing my grip on my cane. Thanks for springing to my aid, I muttered to Tabitha. What? she said from her languid pile. You're the one who's always telling me to keep my trap shut and my claws sheathed around people. Kayla, I whispered, giving her a gentle shake. Uh, she moaned, curling away into a tighter ball. Kayla, wake up, this is important. She made another disgruntled noise as I tried to roll her back toward me. I think something's preying on you. Her eyes opened. Preying on me? Kayla repeated. We were walking up Waverly Place under gray skies, travel mugs of matcha tea in hand. The grassy-tasting brew wouldn't have been my first choice, but her apartment's only coffee offerings were instant, and that was a hard no. As we passed a corner cafe, I leaned into the rich, roasting aroma before catching myself. Can you remember when you started feeling different? I asked. More tired? Maybe a month ago? Around the time I started clubbing with my roomies, I guess. I just chalked up the tiredness to the late nights. She hadn't removed her makeup, and as she squinted, the dark circles made her eyes appear raccoonish. Oh, and then there's the fuller realization of my shadow half, which entails a deeper connection to the subconscious energies associated with sleep. Here we go, Tabitha sighed from the pet carrier. I love you too, Tabby. Kayla said sweetly, which evoked a feline growl. Well, what I'm seeing isn't explained by either, I said. Something's flattening out your aura. Hmm, I have been feeling a little two-dimensional. That's being very generous, Tabitha remarked. I gave the carrier a shake, sending her into a swearing fit and drawing glances from passers-by. How well do you know your roommates? I asked Kayla. What do you mean? Where they come from, their backgrounds, that sort of thing. She shrugged, bulking up the shoulders of the army jacket she'd pulled on. We never really talk about it. It's not considered punk. Well, what about your intuition around them? Her expression turned wistful as she threaded her arm through mine. Now I was speaking her language. You haven't met them, but Sheena and Sid are twins. Energetically speaking, they have this deep soul connection that goes back lifetimes. I saw it right away, the intertwining. Like a pair of flowering vines, one light and exuberant, the other dark and brooding. But they can't survive without each other. 
Her eyes glistened with emotion. It's heartachingly beautiful and tragic at the same time. Can we go back to our own apartment now? Tabitha complained. What about Flick? I asked, unable to hide my disdain for the bozo, but Kayla didn't seem to notice. Oh, he's a six. A six? I repeated. Out of ten? That was being generous. Kayla shook her head. No, it's a personality type of the Enneagram. Sixes are loyalists, and he's as pure a six as I've ever seen. Has he shown any special interest in you? Of course. Sixes are inspired by the need for friendship and security above everything. I extend both without judgment. I'm even covering his part of the rent until he finds work. He savors that. Are you sure that's all he's savoring? Her brow folded briefly. Wait, you think he's the one preying on me? Though I was having a tricky time squaring that idea with the man's epic gracelessness, there were all manner of vampire. The more benign could insinuate themselves into a person's life by passing for weak humans. Once embedded, they fed on the person over time, if not physically, then psychically. Well, I said. She laughed. Flick is harmless. He didn't seem so harmless when he was using me for batting practice. That's because sixes are anxiety avatars. You know, worst case scenario thinkers. It's another defining trait, but it comes from a very sensitive and gentle place. He's only trying to protect me. Because he was a six, I wondered, or because he'd staked her as his food source. Her arm still hooked through mine. Kayla hugged me against her rail-thin frame. Everson, mon ami, you need to trust me on this. I know my roommates well enough to know they're not feeding on me. She was intuitively gifted, and she'd been spot on the last time. Still, this punk phase may have been dulling her faculties. For the moment, though, I agreed to bookmark Flick in order to consider other possibilities. You said you'd been clubbing in the East Village? I prompted. Yeah, mostly at this place called The Stink. It's in this historic bank building on the Bowery. You should see it. The juxtaposition alone is wild. And the energy. She began whipping her black hair back and forth. Hmm, that's another possibility, I mulled aloud. She peered up at me through her displaced hair. Huh? Think about it. Most of the clubgoers are already pale, low energy, and underslept. Take exhibit Kayla, I said, nudging her. No offense. As long as a feeder didn't get too greedy, they could sustain themselves indefinitely in a place like that by sampling widely. No one would ever know. Give it a rest, Tabitha said irritably and for no apparent reason. Does that jibe with anyone you've run into at the club? I asked over her. I'm not really attuned to individuals, Kayla replied. The scene doesn't allow it. It's a clashing together. Sounds, bodies, emotions, all of it surging up until it overwhelms your psychic barriers. Though her eyes grew animated, they lacked their characteristic depth. It's where I met Flick. I tensed, my suspicions toward him igniting again. Kayla came to a sudden stop on the sidewalk and peered up at me. But now that you ask, Flick did mention something about some people passing out. He's always pushing water on me when we're there. My suspicions deepened. Are you going back tonight? There's this band Flick wants us to see, Nihilists, Inc. He's wild about them. Unless you think I shouldn't, I'll go with you, I decided. Really? It's the best way to find the feeder. And to keep tabs on Flick, I thought. Oh, why bother if they're not hurting anyone? Tabitha snapped, explaining her irritation. She still resented me for ending her career as a succubus. But this thing was hurting Kayla, flattening out the qualities that made her uniquely her. And it likely wasn't done. I lurched in surprise as she tugged my arm. Come on, she cried, discovering some hidden reserve of energy. I had to run to keep up with my torso, sending Tabitha skittering and swearing inside her carrier again. Where are we going? I asked. Just up the block, she panted. Iggy's consignment shop. What's there that's so important? Your outfit for tonight. Chapter 3 I can't believe you let yourself get talked into this, Tabitha muttered from her perch across my shoulders. For once, we were of the same mind. 
Kayla paid the cab fare plus the after dark premium, squirmed off my lap, and scooted out after Sid and Sheena. We had managed to cram all six of us inside, Flick folding himself into the passenger seat. When Kayla noticed I wasn't behind her, she reached back into the cab and tugged my leather sleeve. Come on, Everson, she said. You look totally gaba. Tabitha snorted, and appropriately so. I looked ludicrous. The trip to the consignment shop for my outfit had yielded a studded motorcycle jacket, a shredded concert t-shirt that showed way too much chest, a chain that looked like it belonged on a bike, and black denim pants so tight-fitting that my entire male ancestry was suffering. But when Kayla tugged again, I sighed and let myself get drawn out. Push over, Tabitha snorted. Once again, I couldn't argue, but I reminded myself this was for an important cause. I'll probably just stay for a little while, I told Kayla. You know, do a couple circuits around the club, check everyone out, then head back if I don't find anything. You have to stay for the headliner. That's when the place fills up. She'd done little to her own ensemble besides add more black makeup, and now her ringed eyes implored me. And you're sure it won't be a problem getting Tabitha inside? I asked. She was still perched heavily across my shoulders, her studded collar attached to a retractable chain I gripped in my non-cane hand. I hadn't wanted to risk leaving her in Kayla's unwarded apartment for the night, but as I eyed the swelling crowd around the club's entrance, I questioned my decision. Are you kidding? Kayla said. It's the definition of punk. Still, maybe we should just... I gestured back toward the cab an instant before the driver laid rubber. Kayla tousled my stiff hair with a smirk. Looks like you're stuck with us. Because I hadn't let her near me with an electric razor, she'd settled for gelling my hair into something chaotic evil. She also snipped and arranged a row of safety pins across my right eyebrow, which I'd also forbidden her from shaving, creating the illusion of piercings. Like I said, ludicrous, unwizardly at the very least. Limping after Kayla in a pair of black Converse chucks, the final pieces of my punk ensemble, we caught up to Sid and Sheena. They embodied the light and dark twinning Kayla had described, Sid with his snow-white hair and chatty nature, and Sheena with her raven-black head stubble and sullen eyes. I'd checked them out back at the apartment. Both looked fine. It was just Kayla I was concerned about, and Flick with his vampiric buzz. He'd stayed away all day, spoiling my plan to test him with holy water. Kayla confided that he'd struggled with substance abuse, which may have accounted for the unsettling energy, but still. Flick had loped ahead in his combat boots to talk to the bouncer, and now he waved anxiously for us to join him. The necklace bouncer unclasped a sagging rope at the head of the line and allowed us through. Flick knows the owner, Kayla shouted in my ear. The black lights illuminating the club's interior made her appear ghoulish, and the volume was suddenly tremendous. Somewhere beyond the scrum of bodies on the main floor, a woman shrieked into a mic alongside the roaring of guitars and slamming of drums, the dingy tiles of the former bank amplifying the insane discord. Exhilarating, right? Kayla shouted. It's a lot, I agreed. I invoked shields over Tabitha's and my ears to muffle the head-splitting noise. Flick aimed straight toward the stage, his angular limbs jousting inside the free-for-all. Though he hadn't said it, I could tell he'd been unhappy about me coming. Sheena and Sid followed, pulling Kayla after them. When she looked back at me, I made a circling motion with my finger to tell her I was going to start searching. I was already picking up some odd currents, and one in particular was raising the hairs on my hands with its frosty vibe. I peered around, trying to pinpoint the source. Above the crowd's jumping, slamming bodies, I caught the pink spikes of the lead singer slash screamer, but her vibe was anything but cold. Craning my neck around to face Tabitha, I pointed at my eyes to tell her to keep a lookout. She peered back at me blandly. I'd promised her food perks for her help, though I wasn't holding out hope. At least she wasn't being crabby. And then it struck me that this was her first time outside her carrier in a crowd. She may have despised people with a passion, but they'd been her food source for centuries. I pictured her eyeing them keenly as I stiff-legged my body through a crowd of leather jackets, spiked studs, mohawks, tattoos, giant shit-kickers, and piercings galore. I must have blended in, because Tabitha caught more looks than me. But even those were fleeting. It must not have been considered punk to stare. 
I winced as her claws dug into my neck. See something? I shouted over her shoulder. No, just testing our communication system. I set my jaw and was about to press forward when her claws punctured me a second time. Ow, damn it, stop! But when I jerked my head around, she was staring past me. I followed her ochre green gaze to a bar area where a cluster of patrons were gathered, but nothing about them or the bartender stood out. The mutt, Tabitha said, preempting my question. I moved my gaze over and down to where an Irish wolfhound stood in a dim doorway. The shaggy dog peered back at us with dull eyes. I was about to tell Tabitha to stay focused on our search when I noticed the dog's aura, a cold outline, barely there. My heart double-thumped in my chest. The dog's a blood slave, meaning he serves a vampire. Are you going to destroy it or not? Tabitha asked impatiently. We need to be smart about this. He's probably acting as a sentry for whatever's back there. Even as I spoke, I was picking up a chilly draft from the doorway. Well, I don't know how much longer I can tolerate the dumb brute, she continued. Just look at him. How about we try being a little less obvious, huh? I pretended to become interested in the bar as I weighed our next move. The mirror behind the shelves caught my reflection. Sweet Jesus, I'd almost forgotten about the eyeliner I'd let Kayla apply. When I glanced back, the dog was gone. Where did it go? I asked, peering around. Relax, Tabitha said. He went through the door and good riddance. I circled the bar and stood with my back to one side of the doorway. Drawing the shadows around us with an invocation, I pulled a potion from a jacket pocket and tipped back the bitter-tasting concoction. Within moments, stealth magic began tingling through me. What are you doing? Tabitha huffed. Finding the dog's owner, I said, slipping through the doorway. I gave myself a mental backclap for brewing a potion strong enough to envelop her too. Getting Tabitha to partake would have been hell. But the dim corridor immediately put me on edge. It was narrow for one, scuzzy for another, and I had a sinking feeling it was going to lead down. I followed the sound of the dog's panting breaths and scraping footfalls until, sure enough, a set of cement steps appeared off to our right. The chilly vibe was emanating from below. Ahead, the dog's footfalls shuffled to a stop, and a burst of spattering sounded. We'd lucked out and caught him on a bathroom break. Bracing against my phobia, I hurried down the steps, the potion muting my footfalls. The steps led to a basement level illuminated by a large blind-covered window. A closed door stood beside it, muffling the voices beyond. I crept past an assortment of amps and dusty instruments, placing myself against a wall of old flyers between the window and a busted pipe organ. I counted three voices, but one stood out for its frostiness, like teeth raking over ice. That was our vampire, the one who had been singling out clubgoers for his late-night cravings, including Kayla. A knot of anger pulled hard in my stomach, but I paused to consider my grandfather's ring. Centuries before, my magic-wielding forebears had aligned with vampires during the Inquisition. Their truce was formalized in the Brasov Pact and symbolized in a ring I'd inherited and was presently wearing. Maybe it was my imagination, but the ring seemed to be telling me this vampire belonged to a strain that had fought alongside my forebears, meaning he was off-limits, damn it. The deal, a gruff voice was saying. Lies beyond thee, the vampire answered. Kill her, a third voice said. I scanned the window until I spotted a seam in the plastic blinds. My skin-tight jeans wouldn't allow me to stoop, so I bent awkwardly, forcing Tabitha to dig desperately into my jacket to maintain her perch. Through the narrow slice, I spied three sets of legs, large brown corduroys, tight black leathers, and white polyester. They were standing around something on the floor. When corduroys shifted, I saw what? A young woman. Her eyes were closed, her slack face leached of color and life. I seized the doorknob, power storming into my cane. Screw the Brasov Pact. Chapter 4 The trio I burst in on couldn't have looked more different, but I didn't spend time marveling over that fact. Vigore! I bellowed, thrusting my cane toward Corduroy's. He was a big man with a thick, graying beard. My force blast caught him where his pants, bib overalls actually, swelled around his ample belly. 
He went toppling over a littered desk, papers cascading in his wake. Leathers was already backing away from the girl. He was young and shirtless with a stout, tattooed torso and a sweaty mass of black hair. My invocation caught him high, sending him pancaking into an old soundboard. Knobs and dimmer switches spilled over him as he collapsed to the floor. I wheeled toward the vampire. Not a man, I saw with some surprise, an older woman. Thinning hair framed a dark, jowly face, and though the shape beneath her polyester suit was best categorized as wobbly, I wasn't stupid. Her lethal nature more than made up for her late start as a vamp. She stared at me with eyes as cold and hostile as the waves emanating off her. My invocations had burned through the lion's share of my stealth potion, and in her preternatural vision, I was plain as day. But she didn't budge from the girl sprawled at her feet. Oh, I'm sorry, I said. Did I interrupt your feeding? Her eye bags quivered slightly as her pupils drew to points. Attack me, I thought, an invocation at the ready. Come on, try and open my throat. I didn't know the consequences for violating the Brasov Pact, but there had to be a self-defense provision. She didn't attack, though. She stood firm in her platform shoes. Then, very deliberately, she spoke. You're making a grave mistake, wizard. Turn around, walk away, and maybe I'll forget what you've done here tonight. Though the threat unnerved me, I replied with the same deliberateness. Not without her. I glanced down. Like the guy now snoozing under the soundboard, the victim was in leather pants. Unlike him, she wore a dingy white t-shirt, something in black marker scrawled across its front. Back off, I told the vampire, pushing power into my wizard's voice now. Tabitha sighed from my shoulders. I know you don't approve of swearing, but it would do a lot for your messaging right now. You're about to cross a very dangerous line, the vampire said. Yeah, well, a line's nothing without something to actually back it up, Tabitha scoffed. You're not even going to put a bitch at the end of that. The vampire set her jaw as I took a step forward, and then another. With my next step, her gaze flicked to my ring. Even if she wasn't privy to the history of the pact, her ancestral instincts must have understood its power, staying her hand. But did she understand I couldn't attack, either? I took another step toward her. I'd gone without protection in order to make myself a tempting target, but now that I was close enough to see the violet capillaries beneath her cheeks, I whispered a word of protection. The vampire grinned in my shield's glistening light. I'd shown weakness, yeah, but I'd also encountered enough of her kind to know she could crush my throat at this range before I even blinked. Losing your nerve, wizard? Me, I said, trying to recover some bravado. You're the one just standing there. Bitch, Tabitha put in for me. I started to kneel, but my damned pants prevented it. Leaning awkwardly to the side, I gripped the victim's arm. Her skin was cool but pliant, suggesting she was still alive. Once I had her out of the room, I would try to revive her, but the vampire crouched opposite me, gripping the woman's other arm. Let go, I said. You first, she countered, telling me she fully understood the game. We straightened at the same time, the young woman hanging limply between us. When I tugged, the vampire made herself an immovable force. If her arm tears free, she said, it will be your doing, not mine. We were stalemated, damn it. I lowered the young woman back down, the vampire matching me move for move. When I released her, so did she. The victim sagged back to the vampire's feet. I would have to revive her here. But first... Protezione! I shouted, expanding my shield. For the first time, the vampire flinched back, but my play had been defensive. She eyed the fresh barrier between her and her victim with barely concealed fury. I shaped the protection into a dome around us. Surprise, I thought smugly. But there was no time to celebrate. Hovering the opal in my cane over the young woman, I uttered words of healing, something I'd never done with a vampire standing this close. Rather than unnerve me, her lethal presence sharpened my focus while also making me hyper-aware of my surroundings. Papers ruffled from the desk, and in my peripheral vision, I saw corduroys pawing into view beside a water cooler. His bearded face paused to take in the scene. Is that him? he asked. It would appear so, the vampire said thinly. Then why the hell aren't you doing anything? He's protected, she hissed. All I can do at the moment is keep him from taking her, 
but nothing's stopping you. Anything you aim at me, I warned Corduroys through gritted teeth, is going up your backside. Better, Tabitha allowed, but is it really so hard to say ass? I was beginning to guess the connection between these three. Corduroys, whom I pegged as the owner, was allowing the vampire use of his club for hunting. It must have been Leathers' job to separate the victims from the crowd, delivering them here to the vampire. Thanks to powers of mind control, the vampire could make it so the victims wouldn't remember being fed on, like with Kayla. But she'd drawn too much this time. As I grew more healing light around the young woman, I considered how easily this could have been Kayla. And hadn't Kayla said Flick was friends with the owner? I'd been right to distrust the dweeb. Leathers stirred under the soundboard. Hey, man, what's that poser doing to Rebel? Clearly finishing the job, you cretin, the vampire spat. Finishing the job? He squinted between us. Then why aren't you doing anything? The vampire released an aggrieved sigh. Because he's protected. A wet fit of barking erupted behind us and the wolfhound came charging into the room. Duke, the vampire shouted. He collided headfirst into the shield, leaving a messy saliva imprint, and then began raking it with his front paws. In my startlement, it took me a moment to recognize the gift. As far as the Brasov Pact was concerned, an attack by a slave was the equivalent of an attack by the controlling vampire. With a hard grin, I drew my sword from my cane. Forzadora, I shouted, but in my anxiousness I neglected to dispel my shield. The blast blew it apart in a brilliant explosion of sparks, blunting my attack. Instead of embedding the vampire in the far wall, the force only lobbed her against it. She landed in a tripod stance, her face dark with rage. I thrust my staff now, preparing to enclose her in a vice of hardened air. The bottle of holy water in my jacket pocket would do the rest. But this time I forgot about the damned wolfhound. His teeth seized my ankle in a bright burst of pain. Ah! I barked. Before I could react, Tabitha dropped onto him like an orange mortar and began clawing his eyes. With a hoarse cry, the wolfhound released me and went into a head-shaking, body-bucking fit to dislodge her. I turned back to the vampire in time to see her flying in. Protez! I started. She smashed my staff aside with a fist as the crown of her head drove into my chin. I went down hard, the metallic taste of blood filling my mouth. She landed on top of me, ice-cold hands pinning my wrists. I warned you, wizard, she hissed, saccharine breath breaking against my face. Her features began to blur, and not from my head racking the floor. Her breath carried a powerful opiate, and I'd just inhaled a lungful or two. Man, every time I thought I was leveling up, I went and did something utterly stupid. With Tabitha still riding the wolfhound, I flipped through my options, but my thoughts were starting to mist. I tried to shift from the pressure of the vampire's knee against my side, pressing something into my ribs. Wait, that's the holy water. With enough pressure, I could blow the bottle in my pocket, soaking her leg. Protezione, I whispered. A spherical enclosure took hold around the bottle. Now, it was just a matter of... Someone else burst into the room, shaking my concentration. I recognized the ungainly footfalls immediately. When he arrived above me... His blonde spikes and bulging eyes left no doubt, even as they blurred. Flick, I managed. You son of a... Chapter 5 A conference of voices grew in my hearing, the words taking gradual form. I must have passed out because I couldn't remember the vampire climbing off me, or binding me to a chair. I struggled to free my arms, but they were pinned. Let's ask him. Flick said, peering over. The vampire's opiate had left me with a splitting headache, but also feeling strangely detached, as if the situation weren't quite real. I looked for my cane, before realizing Flick was holding it. How long have you been doing this? he asked. Doing what? I snapped irritably. You people are as vague as my cat. They had used Tabitha's retractable chain to bind me, then I was relieved to find her perched to my left. She was licking a minor wound on her shoulder, but she was in one piece. The slave hound had evidently gotten the worst of the exchange, his swollen face peering timidly from behind the vampire. Praying on our club, the vampire replied. I laughed. I'm not the one with the pointy canines and bad blood habit. Then what were you doing to Rebel? The owner demanded. 
Cowed by my earlier attack, he remained behind his desk. A button was missing from his bib overalls and his beard was in disarray. I followed his gaze to the young woman still on the floor. Her head was in Leathers' lap now, and he was trying to wake her. From my angle, I could read the scrawl on her t-shirt. Nihilists, Inc. Weren't they tonight's headliner? And now I recognized the duo from one of the posters in Kayla's apartment. The owner released a weighty sigh. So what do we do with him? If he'd let me snap his neck like I'd wanted, we wouldn't be having this discussion. The vampire looked pointedly at Flick, who showed his hands. Hey, he's a friend of Kayla's and she's usually a good judge of character. The vampire scoffed. She's a nitwit. Tabitha paused in her self-care to grunt in agreement. But are we sure he's the one? The owner asked. Like north of 90%? What does it matter? The vampire shot back. Even if he isn't, it will be one less potential hassle. I wasn't as disturbed by the talk as I should have been, partly for the lingering effects of the opiate, but mostly because these three had never dealt with a magic user before. The contents of my jacket pockets, the potions and holy water, were piled on the corner of the desk. With a simple incantation, I could turn them into mini bombs. But something about this whole thing wasn't adding up. They were talking as if I were the predator. Another scenario began taking shape in my mind, one that explained how a club could operate in the East Village after dark. The owner must have partnered with the vampire for security purposes. A lower-level vampire, but one powerful enough to keep away undesirables, allowing the club to flourish. I'd seen a similar partnership at work in Times Square around the time I acquired Tabitha. Hey, guys, I called. I think we're on the same side. No one's talking to you, the vampire snapped over a shoulder. Listen, I came here tonight because I thought something in your club was preying on patrons, and when I saw Rebel on the floor there, I thought it was you guys. Well, her, specifically, I nodded at the vampire. She opened her mouth, but then her eyes snapped toward Rebel, who'd begun to stir. Hey, can you hear me? Leathers asked, stroking Rebel's bright orange hair in a way that suggested they were more than bandmates. Are you all right? Her eyes opened, and he helped her to sit up. Can we get her something to drink? He asked urgently. Before I realized what Flick was doing, he rushed up with my bottle of holy water. Hey, that's not... I started to say, but he was already tipping the bottle to her lips. I shrugged. Maybe it would wash out the residual effects of whatever attacked her. As she sipped, water ran down the neck of the bottle, wetting Flick's fingers. I watched for a reaction, but nothing happened. All right. So maybe he's not a preternatural leech, I thought grudgingly. When Rebel held up a hand to say she'd had enough, Flick capped the bottle, clearly stoked to have played nurse to one of his punk gods. Can you tell us what happened? He asked her, casting me a suspicious look. Yeah, um, Rebel squinted, struggling to think back. We were in the rehearsal space, getting ready. Grease ran out to the van to grab a pedal, didn't you, babe? I remember the space turning really dark, and then something started choking me. She gripped her throat with one hand. And then I guess I passed out. That's how I found you, Grease confirmed. The owner pushed up his glasses and nodded darkly. Same as the others. And what a coincidence, the vampire turned to me. All abilities he possesses. But I wasn't completely gone, Rebel continued. I remember entering this altered state, like I was dreaming, but not really. Probably what a coma feels like. I was in a narrow space where I could barely breathe, like the bottom of a deep well. And there was a presence there, another person, but I couldn't see them. They were stuck in the corner of my vision, out of sight every time I turned. Dude, you need to write that down, Grease said. It would make a killer song. Then a light appeared, she continued. The presence left, the well opened out, and I could breathe again. And that was when I woke up, I think. The light part was me, I volunteered. She stared at me before nodding slowly. I saw your face. That wasn't uncommon with healing magic. I shot Flick a self-satisfied look, forcing him to lower his bulging eyes. The owner nodded at me. Untie him. Why? The vampire challenged. Because this crap has been going on for a month now. People are starting to talk, saying the stink isn't safe anymore. The diehards still come, yeah, but our crowds aren't what they were. 
We should have had two times the turnout for Nihilus Inc. on a Saturday, and now they might not even be able to take the stage. If this guy wants to help us, let him. You're being hasty, the vampire said, biting down on the last word. Yeah, well, I have the bigger stake in this place. I sensed that the attacks had created a rift between them. If the vampire couldn't keep the club safe, what good was she to him? She stared at him another moment, jaw set, before freeing me none too gently. When I tried to stand, I couldn't get my jeans to bend enough to plant my feet under me. A hand? I asked, extending mine toward her. Dumb move, I realized, too late. Though she barely flinched, the vampire's yank was powerful enough to bring my shoulder to the brink of dislocation. I launched upright and came to a stuttering stop in front of Flick. I'll take that, I said, snatching my cane from his grasp and turning toward the desk. The owner shrank back, but when he saw I was just collecting my things, he offered a tentative hand. I'm Big Bill, he said, and my partner there is Jackie. Everson, I said, pumping his thick grip. I'm sorry we got off to a rough start. He was bracing his back with his other hand, but he waved away my apology as though being thrown over his desk was only a minor inconvenience. Any idea what we're dealing with? he asked. I had conflicted feelings about working with his partner. It went against everything my magical line stood for and could land me in very hot water with the order. But the club was ground zero for whatever had preyed on Kayla, and a collaboration of convenience gave me access to the entire building. I have some ideas, I said. You mentioned other victims? Yeah, people passing out, he said. At first we thought the crowds were causing them to dehydrate. You know, all the body heat. I put water coolers around the club, but when it kept happening, we started asking questions. Most of the ones dropping out said the same thing as Rebel, about the darkness and strangling. Any other patterns? I asked. The victims are usually alone, in a bathroom or backstage. This thing doesn't seem to like to attack in the open. My normal M.O. would have been to take that info, return to my library slash lab, research half the night, and then come back armed for a showdown. But with my loft presently in a toxic fog, all of that was out. Entities like this usually have a source, I said, whether that's an object or a power spot. If we're talking a spectral entity, something may have disturbed it. Has there been any construction here in the last month or so? Bill consulted Jackie before shaking his head. We're two years in now, and we've pretty much left the building as is. Then I'll need to search every room. And once you find this entity, you can get it out of here? He asked. For good? I nodded, praying the potions and implements I had on hand would be up to the job. Until then, we'll need to make sure everyone in the club uses the buddy system. No going anywhere alone. Bill scratched his neck. Yeah, this is a hardcore punk scene. Those aren't exactly rule followers up there. I mean, if it weren't for Jackie, they'd have burned the place down at least a half dozen times by now. We'll announce it when we go on later, Grease volunteered. We'll figure out a way to make it edgy. He'd been consulting with Rebel, who was standing now, both of them largely ignoring Flick as he moved around them like a hyperactive chicken. Apparently, they intended for the show to go on. Bill produced a thick chain of keys. Where do we start? I swallowed dryly. The lowest level. Chapter 6 Did the mutt have to tag along? Tabitha complained. Just let it go, I whispered. We're on the same team now. Big Bill was leading us down into the bowels of the building, keys jangling in his grasp. Jackie had come too, probably because she didn't want me getting all the credit for doing her job. Meanwhile, Rebel and Grease had returned to the rehearsal space while Flick had gone back to the main floor under my orders to stay close to Kayla. He was to call Bill's phone if anything suspicious turned up. But Tabitha only cared about Duke. Though the dog had largely healed from her attack, he kept his plodding, panting distance, casting worried glances her way. I was actually starting to feel sorry for the wolfhound. Same team, Tabitha repeated indignantly. Speak for yourself. If you'd done your part and handled Miss Pointy Teeth, I would have put him out of his misery. I was most of the way to choking him out as it was. The only reason you're still alive, Jackie informed her, is because Duke was originally Bill's dog, not mine. Then she added under her breath, 
drooling good for nothing oaf. Now that we can agree on, Tabitha purred, satisfied someone had come over to her side. Keep it up and I may grow to like you. Please don't, I said. Here we are, Bill announced. The sub-basement. A damp metal door glinted in the light of my cane. Though my heart pounded sickly at being this deep, we were very likely looking at the culprit's lair. Feeders and their ilk took to permanent darkness like mold to shower grout. When was the last time someone came down here? I asked Bill. He shrugged as he searched for the right key. Before we were a club, probably. I know I've never been inside. I mean, would you? It's not as bad upstairs, but this is how the club got its name. I smelled what he meant. The stink seeping from the door space was a combination of raw sewage and rotting meat. Bill found the key, strong-armed the stubborn lock, and stepped aside as the door creaked open. I'll wait out here with Duke, if that's all right, he said. Yes, we would prefer that, Tabitha replied pointedly. There was no use shushing her. Not only did my present company know she could talk by now, they'd also picked up on her charming disposition. As I stepped inside, the light from my cane illuminated a low-ceilinged space that must have been a trash receptacle from the bank days. Water trickled somewhere, probably from a fractured sewage line, and dark puddles glistened across the floor. I pulled the neck of my tattered shirt over my nose, for all the good it did. Jackie splashed up beside me. What are we even looking for? I cut my gaze around a space that was way too cluttered for a manual search. Can you two keep watch for a moment? I'm going to probe a little deeper. See the way he orders me around, Tabitha said. It's because you haven't trained him, Jackie replied brusquely. Oh, Tabitha shifted her body in interest. Tell me more, please. As the vampire and my cat discussed strategies, I sighed and tapped into my wizard's vision. The room receded into a complex pattern of currents, all of them dark and dull. But there was one spot that drew my attention. In the far corner, under an especially large junk pile, lay a slow heaving void. My mentor had warned against poking around the deep dark places in the city. You never knew what you might awaken. But if this thing was attacking people, it was already awake, right? I hate to break up your reverie, Jackie said, making me jump, but we're not alone down here. The sub-basement snapped back into focus. Where? I whispered. She pointed to the same pile I'd just honed in on, its top nearly touching the sagging ceiling tiles. Can you tell what it is? I asked. I thought you were the expert. Bitter about her demotion, Jackie wasn't planning to help me any more than necessary. Okay, I whispered, separating my cane into sword and staff. I'm going to enclose the entire pile, try to squeeze whatever's inside out of existence. That wasn't a maneuver I'd mastered. I'd yet to really practice it, but my other option was putting my blade through it, and I didn't want to get my hands dirtier than necessary in this giant petri dish. Whatever happens, I added, don't let it out of the room. In fact... I closed the door with an invocation and added a locking spell for good measure. Adjusting my slick grip on my glowing staff, I extended it toward the pile. With a spoken word, a glimmering dome took shape around the soggy heap. My magic scraped concrete as I urged it into a spherical enclosure. I noticed Jackie watching, her shrewd eyes gauging the extent of my power, but I was more preoccupied with the pile. In its depths, something was jerking to life. I willed the sphere smaller, crushing old furniture and squeezing out a freshet of foul brown water. I was just beginning to think this might work when the mass inside kicked and began pushing back. Powerfully. Having trouble, wizard? Jackie asked in a taunting voice. Not at all. I managed as sweat sprang from my brow and ran, stinging into the corners of my eyes. I brought a shoulder up before realizing my motorcycle jacket had no absorptive properties. Hey, Tabby? With a sigh, she brought the back of her paw around and sponged the sweat from my eyes. I blinked past strands of her shed hair, able to see again. The part of me not grappling with the mound was moved by her gesture. I expect compensation, she said thinly, drawing her paw on the back of my head. What's in there anyway? We're about to find out, I grunted because I could no longer hold it. I'd shrunk the enclosure by half, but I'd hit a wall. The glimmering sphere was trembling along with my staff arm. 
As foamy waves began lapping the edges of my vision, I released the invocation with a gasp. Thanks to the built-up pressure, the pile exploded out, pelting us with gobs of debris. The vampire used her speed to evade most of the soggy shrapnel, but I caught plenty, as did Tabitha, judging by her word choices. In what remained of the pile, something slick and purple thrashed into view. Well, crap, I muttered. Is that it? Tabitha asked in disgust. The worm-like creature was the size of a hippo and ugly as sin, but it wasn't our predator. It was a nether creature, probably called up before the city became my beat. The creature must have tunneled in here to gestate. Content with passively absorbing the abundance of moisture and sewage, it remained dormant. So dormant, in fact, that the citywide wards never alerted me to its presence. Probably not, I confessed, but I have an obligation to put it down. As if on cue, a psychic foghorn sounded in my head. The ward's alarm system. Jackie huffed. That's on you, she tugged the steel door handle. Let me out of here. Before I could dispel the sealing magic, a purple tendril snapped around her ankle. She seized the handle with both hands as the tendril contracted, drawing the massive worm toward Jackie instead of vice versa. The slimy tendril had shot from a wriggling mass around the worm's gaping mouth. Jackie swiped at it with a clawed hand, but more appendages arrived, wrapping her other leg and lifting her horizontally. You have a sword, you fool, she shouted. Cut these damned things off me. Yeah, uh, hold tight for a minute. One of the rare times the expression actually fit, but I had an idea. Invoking a protective shield around myself, I eased toward the worm. Tendrils lashed at me, but not liking the shield's energy, they diverted toward Jackie, who soon resembled a spool of purple thread. Everson, I'm warning you, she screamed, pausing to tear at them with her teeth. In its effort to pry her from the door, the worm reared up, my eyes locked on a spot on its pale underbelly. With its next tug, the worm slid within range. Remembering to lower my shield this time, I thrust my sword. Disfare, I bellowed as the blade sank into its soft mass. Reserve energy stormed from my mental prism, shook down the length of the blade, and burst through the worm. I squinted away as the worm detonated like a monster sneeze, its phlegmy makeup spattering the room's walls. Behind me, I heard Jackie fall to the floor. I peeked to find her scowling and wiping away the last of the sublimating tendrils. The creature was gone, cast back to its nether realm. Thanks for the diversion, I said. I'm not talking to you, she snapped. Unlock this. I dispelled the magic around the door and she pulled it open. Bill, who was frowning down at his phone, looked up, wild-eyed. Urgent message from Flick, he said. Something's attacking the main floor. Chapter 7 Jackie was the first to arrive at the turbulent scene. I came panting in well behind her, followed by Duke, much to Tabitha's annoyance. Much of the crowd was piled against the main door, bouncers struggling to keep them from crushing one another, while other clubgoers ran in search of alternate exits. A handful just stood around like pillars, too shocked or stoned to move. Emergency lights had gone on, casting everything in red. See anything? I asked Jackie. She shook her head and shushed Duke, who'd started to bay at the commotion. I spotted Flick's lanky figure opposite us. He'd backed Kayla, Sid, and Sheena against the far wall and was facing the room with a cocked fist. I looked around as I ran toward them, but I couldn't see a damned thing. What happened? I shouted. Flick, whom I was beginning to suspect of nearsightedness, jerked in surprise and threw his fist out. I ducked, inadvertently putting Tabitha in his path. She batted aside the clumsy blow and scoffed. Weakling? I waved my arms in front of him. Hey, man, it's me, Everson. Flick's engorged eyes seemed to focus, and he lowered his fist. Bill gave you the message? Blade and her crew were finishing a bitch and set when the lights went out and the entire mosh pit started collapsing around us. I mean, it was like Viet friggin' Nam in there. Everyone dropping like flies. I looked at where I'd glimpsed the performer's pink hair earlier, now an abandoned stage of wires, amps, and instruments. A thick pillar had blocked my view, but the field of bodies was in plain sight now. Jackie veered over to the thirty-odd victims with Duke the Wolfhound sniffing around them. Flick continued his rapid-fire delivery. People started yelling, shoot her, because that's what it looked like. Whole place went nuts, every punk for themselves, but it's the same thing that got Rebel, isn't it? Did you see anything? I asked before catching myself. 
He could hardly see two feet in front of his nose. Kayla appeared under his arm, a hand to her chest. Hey, are you all right? I asked, gripping her shoulder. Her makeup notwithstanding, she looked really faint. Not all there. Yeah, just got a little panicked, she replied in a hoarse voice, squeezing my hand. I've never been in the middle of something like that. Flick pulled us out of there. I nodded at him in appreciation. Though we'd gotten off to a rocky start, he seemed to be everything Kayla had claimed. A six, with all the associated anxieties and protective instincts. He was also the reason Jackie hadn't broken my neck. With the club clearing out, he relaxed his stance, allowing Sid and Sheena to edge out from behind him, too. Did anyone see anything? I asked the group. Heads shook, all except for Kayla's. I felt something, Tabitha moaned. Here we go again. It was fleeting, Kayla continued, but it was an impression of deep anger and... and... hunger? No, that's not the right word. Greed, she decided, nodding to herself. A suctioning well of greed. This was sounding more and more like a vengeful spirit, and with the mass attack coming on the heels of our exploration of the sub-basement, I wondered if we'd come close to the source after all. Kayla shuddered as if to disassociate herself from whatever she'd felt, but I trusted her intuition on this. Rebel had mentioned a well, too. All right, why don't you guys head back to the apartment, I said. I have a good idea where this thing is seated and how to banish it. That would restore Kayla, as well as the others the spirit had siphoned from, but though her roommates started toward the exit, Kayla remained where she stood. I need to be here, too, she said. Not a good idea. If it came after you once, it could do so again. My amulet may have spared her rebel's fate, as well as the fate of the thirty former moshers, but I didn't want to take any chances. I can handle it. I might even beat you guys back to the apartment, I added to put her at ease. But she shook her head. The dream I mentioned this morning, the one where you came to the apartment? They're all like rebel, Jackie interrupted, the vampire's arrival shocking for its suddenness. Alive, but practically comatose. I raised my eyebrows at Kayla to say, See, this is serious. Where's Bill? Jackie asked abruptly. I looked around for the club owner. He never came up? No, she said thinly. What happened to your buddy system? Crap, I'd broken my own rule and left him behind. The dog's head cocked suddenly. With a ragged howl, he bounded toward the doorway that led downstairs. Jackie flashed into a run, and I took off after them. Go back to the apartment, I called over her shoulder. Chapter 8 Bill was face down in the space outside his office, an arm thrust out as if he'd been reaching for the handrail to the stairs leading up. Duke whined as Jackie rolled Bill onto his back. The man's eyes stared blankly at the ceiling. I feared he was dead, but then his great torso pushed out a wheezing breath. Do what you did for Rebel, Jackie ordered me. He has a bad heart. I nodded quickly and went to work. As my healing light spread over Bill, Jackie's staring eyes remained eerily cold. Her desire for Bill to recover wasn't compassion, it was business. He and the club were her meal ticket. I was wrapping up my incantation, pinching off the magic, when cold hands seized my throat from behind. I dropped my cane and threw my hands to my neck, but I couldn't work them under the constricting grip. As I gargled out a cry that sounded disturbingly orcish, chaos broke around me. Duke began jumping and barking rowdily. Tabitha shouted for him to shut up, and Jackie... Where was Jackie? Wait. Panicked thoughts jagged through my head. Was she in league with the attacker? Part of some plan to seize control of the club? The only thing that mattered at the moment was getting myself unstrangled. With my vision spotting over, I dug into my jacket pocket and managed to unscrew the bottle of holy water. I drew it out and shook it behind me. A shriek sounded and the strangling force released me. Heaving for air, I spun to find Jackie performing a mad dance. She'd avoided the brunt of the dousing, but enough water had gotten onto her arms that smoke was streaming from her sleeves. I was preparing to hit her with the remaining water when I noticed she was holding my cane. Not to make you feel like an even bigger ass, Tabitha said from my shoulder, but she wasn't the one throttling you. In fact, she just helped you. What? I said hoarsely. With your cane, dummy. 
Jackie dropped my cane so she could slap at her burns with both hands. The hands I had believed were wringing my throat. As I recovered my cane in a daze, the light from the healing spell receded back into the opal. She must have swung it through the entity, the lingering magic breaking it up. Okay, uh, just stay there, I stammered at her. I hurried into Bill's office, returned with the water cooler, and upended it over her arms. Jackie rubbed them vigorously until the last of the holy water washed away. Then she batted the large jug out of my hands. As it shattered against a wall, I braced for a follow-up blow to my person, but something restrained her. Maybe the Brasov pact. She brought her face up to mine. You owe me, wizard, she hissed. You never wanted to be indebted to a vampire, but now wasn't the time for wheedling. Thanks for what you did. I'm really sorry about the misunderstanding. Did you happen to see what it was? Where it went? Jackie regarded me with an iciness that could have frozen the East River before shifting her predatory eyes to the corridor that led to the sub-basement. A specter, she allowed. Female. Okay, you stay here with Bill, I said. We can't leave him alone again. Tabitha and I will deal with this thing. I took off down the corridor, as anxious to get away from Jackie as I was reluctant to plunge into the foul darkness again. When I was nearly out of earshot, I called back, This will make us even! Tabitha snorted. You really do have a way with women. Thanks to our mad dash up to the main floor, the door to the sub-basement remained unlocked and ajar. With a foot, I eased it the rest of the way open, stepped inside, and grew out the light from my cane. I'm really going to need your powers of perception, I told Tabitha tensely. She sighed. Well, maybe I'm starting to tire of all this hunting around. Look, I know your sympathies lie with whatever the hell this thing is, I said, alert for the slightest movement in the shadows. But you must have felt something when you saw me being strangled just now. Yes, darling. Fear. I hesitated. Really? That you were going to crush me under your collapsing weight. I shook my head. I'd been a fool to walk into that one. Just tell me if you see anything. I'll throw in a couple extra steaks. Prime rib? She asked. How about sirloin? I'm on a budget. Flank, she decided, meeting me a quarter of the way. Fine. I would scrounge up the money somehow. That settled, I returned to my search, puzzling over what I was even searching for. From our brief tussle, I'd learned a couple things about our opponent. One, the power in my protective amulet hadn't deterred it seeming to eliminate a vengeful spirit as a candidate, and two, it hadn't cared for my healing magic. Behind you, Tabitha called. I spun an invocation halfway out of my mouth before seeing that the presence was Kayla. Swearing, I lowered my staff. I didn't say it was the Strangler, Tabitha preempted me. I'm sorry, Kayla said, but I never got to tell you my dream. Flick came splashing in behind her, followed by her other roommates, Sid and Sheena. I threw up my arms in exasperation. Are you guys freaking kidding me right now? Get out! I tried to stop her, Flick panted, but these boots weren't made for running. Holy crap, it stinks in here. What is this place? He shot his phone's flashlight around, nearly hitting me in the face. Leave, I said sternly, shielding my eyes. All of you. It'll take 20 seconds, then I'll go, Kayla said. I promise, this just feels too important. Though my heart slammed with the adrenaline of being in the Strangler's lair and responsible for four potential targets now, this was Kayla talking. I might have dismissed her a couple months ago, but now... Invoking a wall of hardened air to separate us from the rest of the sub-basement, I circled a hand. All right, go ahead. In the dream, you showed up at my apartment, just like you did this morning, but you started making a big fuss about how messy it was. You wanted to clean it up, but I told you I wanted to keep it the way it was. You kept insisting and insisting. Finally, we agreed to clean half and leave the other half a mess. I stared at Kayla, waiting for the rest. And? That's it. Tabitha snorted a laugh. I don't know how exactly, Kayla added, but I know it means something. Oh, and then we ate almonds. Okay, I'll uh, take that under advisement, I said. She nodded as though she'd fulfilled her duty and turned toward the others. Oh, wait, I called, hustling after her. Let me give you something first. With the buddy system no longer a deterrent against the Strangler, I needed to infuse her amulet with healing magic. I was reaching the glowing end of my staff forward when Tabitha nudged my head. I see something. Just a sec. 
Seizing my head in her paws, she pivoted it to where Flick was shining his light around. I started to shake my head loose. Tabitha was being a butt again, then stopped. Flick's shadow wasn't in sync with his gangly body. It was growing, morphing into something broad and ominous. My initial suspicions toward him came screaming back. Had he been projecting the entity this whole time? He gagged suddenly, the specter wrapping his upper body. No, it had only been using his shadow for cover. As Flick dropped to his knees, I swung my cane around and shouted, Liberare! Healing light flashed from the opal, blowing the entity off Flick's back. Where it went, I didn't see. I grew the light out, shrinking the room's shadows into the farthest recesses until the only shadows that remained in our immediate space were our own. But even those couldn't be trusted. Is everyone all right? I asked, peering around. Though Flick was coughing, he raised a hand to say he wasn't badly hurt. I looked from Sid to Kayla to Sheena, then stopped and went back to Kayla. My heart skipped a beat. Something was wrong. Very wrong. What? She asked, twisting to look down at where I was staring. It... It's you, I said. Chapter 9 It explained so many things. The flatness of Kayla's aura, why the attacks in the club had started around the same time she'd begun feeling drained and two-dimensional, and the vampire had said it was female. Everson? Kayla said wordedly. She was examining the floor around all of us now, starting to catch on, because once you saw it, you couldn't unsee it. Though she was standing in the full light of my cane, she wasn't casting a shadow. I always knew she was a weirdo, Tabitha said. Kayla looked up, her eyes round with alarm. What's happening? My first impulse was to clear everyone out, but the source wasn't the sub-basement. It was my friend. My second impulse was to cast a protective shield, but the entity could be hiding in any one of our shadows, in which case I would only be trapping it inside along with the rest of us, and I still didn't know enough about what we were facing, only that it was growing bolder. It had yet to kill, but it only seemed a matter of time. I blew out a steadying breath. Novice practitioner or not, I had to deal with this here and now. All right, I need everyone along this wall. As Flick, Sheena, and Sid walked over in confusion, I gestured for them to face the bricks. Keep an eye on your shadows. Let me know if they're doing anything... unusual. Kayla seized my arm. Are you saying this is me? Earlier today you mentioned exploring your shadow half, I said urgently. What did that entail? It started with a ceremony, an empowerment ceremony... I'd had a blow-up with my former roommates last month, partly why they left. It made me realize I'd been neglecting my shadow. That's the part of ourselves we're too ashamed or afraid to own, so we hide it in the deepest parts of our being, but it never goes away. In my case, it became a powder keg of resentment. My ceremony was meant to honor it. That explained a lot, but not everything. She continued. When Sheena and Sid came knocking the next day, I took it as an affirmation. They got me into the punk scene, where I met Flick. I thought this would be a way to feed my shadow. You know, bring it into fuller expression. She searched the floor around herself again. But what happened? I tried to put it delicately. I think your ceremony empowered your shadow a little more than you intended. So it was me that's been attacking everyone? Your shadow, I corrected her. It went rogue, basically. In that case, we should definitely destroy it, Tabitha said, no longer feeling an affinity for the spectral being. But how does this even happen? Kayla asked. That was the other half of the mystery, but before I could press her for more info, Sid and Sheena began to shout. Flick, with his nearsightedness, joined them a beat later. Their three shadows were climbing the brick wall, fusing into one giant projection. For the first time, I could make out features. Wild hair streamed around a malevolent stare and a large mouth. It was Kayla, and yet it wasn't. I'd only known her as a kind and gentle soul who wept for the world's suffering, but this thing radiated malice, an urge to dominate and destroy. Everyone behind me, I shouted, holding my glowing cane toward the shadow. Before the three could move, the shadow screamed into motion. Sid and Sheena went flying like ragdoll casualties of a child's tantrum, but it was Flick whom the shadow zeroed in on. He flailed into a backpedal as the shadow seized his throat and drove him into a pile of garbage, its mouth opening. Entrapolare! I shouted. 
a glowing sphere hardened into place, halting the being's thrusting face. With an enraged scream, the shadow released Flick and flew around my shrinking enclosure. I was incanting, infusing the sphere with healing magic when Kayla clutched my wrist. I looked over, then down, alarmed to find her on the floor, her face contorting in pain. The shadow may have gone autonomous, but it remained an integral part of her being. By attacking the shadow, I was attacking her. Disfare, I called, dispersing the sphere in a guttering of light. The shadow fled to the far end of the room, plunging behind a pile of garbage. Hey, I'm sorry, I said, helping Kayla up. I didn't realize I was hurting you. Opposite us, Sid and Sheena had recovered from their tumbles and gone over to Flick, who was still down. The twins were banged up, and Flick looked pale enough for the mortuary. As Kayla peered from them to me, I saw her anguish. This entity, this shadow part of her, was harming people she cared for. She released me and turned toward the far end of the sub-basement. This is my responsibility, she said decisively. We'll go together. No, it sees you as a threat now. Then at least let me give you some protection. But as I raised my cane, she shielded her amulet with a hand. Everson, it has to trust me. In fact, she took the amulet off altogether and placed it in my jacket pocket. She patted the small lump and nodded to tell me she would be all right, but she looked as if she still needed convincing herself. Be careful, I told her. I watched anxiously as she picked her way across the room, an invocation ready on my tongue. When she reached the pile the shadow had disappeared behind, she went into a half-crouch. I couldn't hear what she was saying, only the cajoling tone of her voice. She straightened suddenly and returned at a fast walk, the little color gone from her face. She jogged the final length and collapsed against me, face pressed to my tattered shirt. I walled off the back half of the sub-basement to contain the shadow and brought my cane hand to her hitching back. What's wrong? I asked in alarm. What happened? Her voice was muffled against my shirt. The things it said. The things it wants to do. She peered up at me, a kind of fatalism taking hold in her swollen eyes. I need you to promise me something. What? I asked warily. That you'll destroy it. Chapter 10 her words landed like a slap. D destroy it? I stammered. You wouldn't survive. If that's what's in me, I don't want to. I'm begging you, Everson. It wants to hurt and... and... kill. She makes a strong case, Tabitha said. As I regarded Kayla's tortured eyes, I understood that although she'd acknowledged her shadow, empowered it, she'd ultimately rejected it. Embracing punk had been a lateral move, not the same as facing herself. Still, there had to be a way of returning the shadow to her control without harming her. And then I remembered her dream about her apartment. I'd wanted to clean it, and she'd wanted it messy. Finally, we agreed to clean half and leave the other half a mess. Oh, and then we ate almonds. I straightened. Holy crap, that was it. What? Kayla asked, dragging a wrist across her eyes. I need to build a symbol, I said, releasing her. A mandorla. Using a shoe to sweep a section of floor clean, I drew a vial of copper filings and began sprinkling out the pattern. Do you mean a mandala? She asked in confusion. No, no, a mandorla is a healing symbol. It comes from medieval theology. I completed one circle, a little smaller than I wanted, but I had to conserve copper, and started on the other. An empowerment ceremony freed your shadow, I explained, so we need a ceremony just as strong, if not stronger, to return it. Tabitha made a disconsolate noise. Everson, I wasn't being dramatic, Kayla said. If you'd heard what it told me just now, I would have heard what it tells all of us in our darkest moments. You should hear what mine wants to do to my department chairman most days. You said it yourself. The shadow is the part of ourselves we're too afraid or ashamed to acknowledge but given complete autonomy, it becomes a monster. Exactly how it became autonomous was another question, though I was beginning to have an idea. Kayla looked over the growing symbol. And this will fix that? Versions of the Mandorla have been used across cultures to resolve opposing forces. That's what your dream was showing you, showing both of us, the importance of integrating your dual natures. Restoring balance is one of the oldest forms of healing. It also explained why the shadow didn't care for my healing magic. It didn't want to be reconciled. 
I was hoping the mandorla would change that. By the time I sprinkled out the last of the copper, I had two overlapping circles, their intersection an oblong space that resembled... An almond, Kayla exclaimed, catching on. Exactly, and that's where you're going to stand. I removed the safety pins from my right eyebrow, surprised they'd stayed in place, and set them at the pattern's junctures as reinforcements. I then offered Kayla my hand and helped her into the symbol's center. Be careful you don't scuff the lines, I said. The integrity of the symbol is vital. Though I was thinking like a magic user, I was largely pulling from my graduate studies in comparative mythology. The truth was I'd never cast through a mandorla before, never even rendered one. Okay, now we need opposing energies for the two circles, I said, searching my pockets. They can be symbolic, but the one on your right needs to represent light and inspiration, and the one on the left, darkness and destruction. I would volunteer myself for the second, Tabitha said from my shoulders, but I don't feel like moving. How about Sid and Sheena? Kayla asked. I hadn't considered using people, but as I studied Sid's snow-white hair and Sheena's black head stubble and general grimness, I found myself nodding. Having heard their names, the two looked up and I waved them over. I quickly explained the ceremony while positioning them in their respective circles. Kayla had described them as interdependent twins at polar ends of the light-dark spectrum. A hum took up in the mandorla almost immediately. Is everyone ready? I asked. Kayla looked from where Flick had shuffled up beside me to the space beyond my barrier, where her violent shadow lurked. When she nodded, I closed the symbol and began feeding it energy. Sid, I want you to think of your happiest memories, I said. And Sheena? I'm sorry, but I'm going to need you to think of your darkest. Like when she got that haircut, Tabitha muttered. I shushed my cat as I eyed the symbol, alert to its shifting energy. The copper had already begun pulsing like embers, only now it was differentiating, the circle around Sid brightening in proportion to the dimming around Sheena. And where they overlapped, in the almond that contained Kayla, the intensity fluctuated between the two before settling into a stable medium. Good. Good. Do you feel that? I asked Kayla. Yes, she said after a moment, her eyes closed. It's like a spring morning. Inhabit that space as if nothing else exists, I told her. And no matter what happens, don't leave it. I meant that physically as well as energetically, but as an intuitive, she didn't need it spelled out. All right, now let's see what happens when the rubber meets the road. With a whisper, I dispelled my glowing barrier. The shadows in the recessed end of the sub-basement sprang forth. Flick flinched behind me, then squeezed my shoulders as one of the shadows rose above the others. It's okay, I told him. This is what we want. As the tension between the glowing circles grew, a vacuum opened through Kayla, pulling at the missing part of her. But would it be powerful enough to recall the shadow, seeding it all the way back inside her? Without warning, her shadow swept forward and hovered above the mandorla, regarding it with those menacing eyes. Though Kayla's eyes remained closed, her body gave an involuntary shudder. Stay there, I coached her. Right in the middle, that's your space. The shadow circled the symbol like a moth exploring a flame. The mandorla was working. I upped its energy, increasing the light-dark tension, the power of the vacuum. Come on, I thought. Be a good little shadow and go back where you belong. It plunged, suddenly, and for a moment I thought we'd done it. But then Kayla released a muffled cry. Shit. The shadow hadn't returned to her. It was enveloping her head in a smothering call. When Flick dashed forward, I grabbed the back of his jacket. Wait. Hey, man, it's killing her, he cried, his arms and legs pumping in place like a cartoon character's. I shared his fear, but he would only scatter the symbol, and Kayla's dream hadn't been a fluke. This was our best chance. Don't fear it, I called to Kayla. Embrace it right back. Own it. Easy for me to say, but that had to be the key, for Kayla to accept her shadow in full consciousness. As she grappled with the smothering energy, my gaze dropped. She'd begun to shuffle in her struggle, the toe of her right shoe coming perilously close to breaking the container. Let go of me, damn it! Flick yelled. I was still restraining him by his jacket, but his next effort tipped me forward. I pictured both of us stumbling into the mandorla, taking everyone down with us and losing the shadow. Tabitha sank her claws into his jacket collar at the last moment, helping me rein him in. Resetting my feet, I threw caution to the wind and dumped my remaining power into the almond around Kayla. 
Think of it like a child, I shouted above the deafening hum. It might be a little shit, but it's yours. Cyclonic forces circled the room, shifting the sodden piles of garbage. It was coming from the growing power of the symbol. Sid's hair kicked up like a snowstorm. Sheena went down to one knee to brace herself, but Kayla was in the eye, where the sole struggle was between her and her shadow. The symbol started to shimmy, copper filings jittering over the damp floor, safety pins jumping. I'd pushed the mandorla to its limits, but despite my best efforts, the shadow still had the upper hand. Kayla staggered for balance, her toe pushing across the line, breaking the container. The entire mandorla wobbled, then released in a fiery flash. A powerful whoomp threw the five of us in different directions. Tabitha hugged my face as I landed on my back and skidded across a puddle of foul water. Off to my right, Sid and Sheena pushed themselves up for the second time since entering the sub-basement. For Flick, who'd landed off to my left, it was the third time. But Kayla remained down, her arms spread out like a human crucifix. I rushed up to her, Flick soon joining me. While he worked to revive her, I opened my wizard's senses. Come on, Kayla, I thought desperately. Be all right. If I'd screwed up and done irreparable harm, I would never forgive myself. Bracing for the worst, I was startled by the strength of her aura. The flatness was gone, shadows restoring the depths of her unique spectrum. When my vision returned to the sub-basement, her chestnut green eyes were opening. She seemed to take stock of herself before noticing the two of us. Kayla, Flick said urgently. As we helped her to sit up, her pierced lips leaned into a weary smile. I'm all right, she said, but I think I'm done with punk. Chapter 11. Two Days Later Here it is, I announced, descending the ladder from my library, a book open at my chest. It was Monday night and Tabby and I were home again. Despite all my windows being open, the faintest taint of pesticide hung in the air. Not enough to bother me, but Kayla had insisted on purifying the aftermath and was spritzing every surface area in my loft with a homemade concoction. Just a sec, she called from my bedroom. The instinct to help was in her nature, but I also sensed she felt she owed me. Following the successful ceremony in the sub-basement, we'd emerged to find Big Bill, the club owner, awake and talking. Kayla's reintegration with her shadow had released the essence it had siphoned from him, as well as from the thirty-odd clubgoers. When I informed him the threat was over, he thanked me heartily. Of course I said nothing of Kayla's role. As we were leaving, Jackie pulled me aside. In exchange for sparing me from the shadow, she would send me a task at a time of her choosing. I told her that doing her job for her made us even, but thanks. Don't force me to apply pressure, she hissed, cutting her eyes to Kayla. Threatening loved ones was a dick move common among vampires, but I was a full step ahead of her. I presume you've heard of Arno Thorne? I caught something stiffen behind her staring eyes. Good, I said. Because I work for him from time to time, you could say I'm a preferred contractor, and he'd be very upset to hear I was beholden to another vampire, especially one who works in an East Village dive. You're lying, she said. Her eyes shifted to Tabitha, seeking confirmation, but my cat had tired of her, thankfully, because of course I was lying. Arno Thorne ruled the financial district and, by proxy, much of the city. If I ever found myself south of the wall on Liberty Street, much less working for a vampire that absurdly powerful, there was a very good chance I was already undead. I fashioned a smile. Try me. As a minor vampire, she was even more terrified of Arnaud than I was, but chances were good she'd end up in a turf war with a fellow low-level vamp, and if that one didn't take her out, another one would. They were jackals competing for the city's scraps. I left, confident I'd never see her again. Kayla and I spent the rest of the weekend scrubbing the punk and sub-basement off our bodies and sleeping. Her trial with her shadow had taken a lot out of her, and I'd cast more magic in two hours than I had in two months. Sid and Sheena left to visit the latter's brother in Connecticut and mentioned possibly staying there. It was as if they'd been drawn to Kayla's light-dark imbalance, and having helped to restore her, they had no reason to remain. For Flick's part, he slept more than any of us, even foregoing a shower. When you considered the time he'd spent on the floor in the sub-basement, that last part was pretty disgusting. I wondered if his despondency was from missing Nihilus Inc., who never took the stage. 
More likely it related to Kayla's stern talk with him when we'd returned from the club, but I didn't ask. Whatever had been said was between them. Kayla emerged from my bedroom, her black hair under a colorful gypsy scarf, spritzer bottle in hand. She looked more like the person I'd first met, the lingering punk elements serving as accents now. You found something? she asked. Augury, I said, tapping my open book triumphantly. What's that? She sat on my couch and tucked her legs up beside her. It's the skill you possess, the one that's been bugging me. I took a seat in my reading chair opposite her and glanced over to Tabitha. Having devoured the flank cuts I'd promised her, she was snoozing, one paw keeping her belly from rolling off the divan while the other was curled beside a very contented smile. The augurs were soothsayers in the Roman Empire, I explained. Children who showed an inclination for the art were selected from the population, whether citizens or slaves, and put through rigorous education and training. Employed by emperors and Rome's wealthiest, the augurs were revered. That all went away in the subsequent ages, but I'm betting those abilities enhanced certain genes. So it was passed down? She asked, catching on. You once mentioned some Italian on your mother's side? Well, a mix. There were early migrants from North Africa who ended up in Rome. If you're descended from an augur, that would explain your intuition and why I've never seen it in your aura. It's in your DNA. She considered that before nodding slowly. My grandmother on that side had a journal that foretold the deaths in her family. She was one of seven siblings, and whether it was war, bone cancer, or, in the case of her youngest brother falling off a ladder and cracking his head, she dreamt every single one and wrote them down. Well, except for her own, but she'd been the first to pass, which made her journal all the more remarkable. Sounds like auger material, I agreed. But wouldn't there be more of us? What about my aunt and uncles? The ability is probably expressed to varying degrees, but even when expressed, it has to be accepted. We're all born with some intuition. As we age, though, we tend to explain it away until it's as if we have no intuitive ability whatsoever. But in your case, you didn't just inherit a strong dose of augury. You embraced it. She lowered her eyes. But not my shadow. That's another thing about the augurs. They were skilled diviners, but when they needed more specific info about a person or place, they often deployed their shadows. While in the club's sub-basement, I'd remembered reading that tidbit, giving me the idea that Kayla might have augur ancestry. But the augurs spent years developing that mastery, I continued, so that once they released their shadows, they could control them. Even then, it was risky business. I get why you feel bad, but you had no idea you could even free yours in the first place. And being able to control it? Forget about it. She reacted to my New Yorkism with a reluctant smile. As much as it disturbed me, she said, I'm beginning to feel that seeing my shadow up close, talking with it, was something my divinity arranged. I braced for one of Tabitha's cutting remarks, but she was still basking in the afterglow of her meal. I've always felt called to help others, she continued, ever since I can remember, but I guess I haven't been so good at addressing my own needs. During the ceremony, when you told me to think of the shadow as a child, I realized that's what my shadow was. Not a monster, but a little girl who felt ignored, taken advantage of, even, and she was desperate for the world to feel her anger. Then it became really easy to accept her. So, your talk with Flick... Given the shadow's actions, I had a hunch whom the taken advantage of part referred to. She nodded. I told him he had until tonight to pay me his share of the rent or he'd have to leave. The dark side of sixes is that they can be emotionally manipulative, and that's what he'd been doing to me. I just chose not to see it. Demanding the rent would have gone against Kayla's giving nature, but by not demanding it, she'd consigned the conflict and resentment to her shadow half, who'd had no qualms about attacking Flick when it felt threatened. Kayla stretched her arms out in front of her. So, what does being an auger mean as far as my responsibilities? I didn't know any augurs in the city for her to train under, but I would see what books I could find. In the meantime, keep doing what you're doing, I said, using your intuition to help others. If you run into any more issues, we'll figure them out together. Just don't neglect yourself. Oh, I've learned that lesson. Speaking of which, I should go and get my own apartment ready. I made peace with my former roommates and they're moving back in this week. Thanks for purifying mine. 
I sniffed the air as I stood. Oh yeah, much better. She came over and hugged me, our bodies sandwiching the book I was still holding. Thank you, she whispered, kissing my cheek firmly before separating. For everything. Always a pleasure. At the door, she spun. Until the next case? You bet. We're getting pretty good at these. I promise not to be the bad guy twice in a row, she said before blowing a parting kiss. I chuckled as I closed the door behind her. An actual intuitive. Who would have guessed? Chapter 12 I tossed the book with the auger info onto my kitchen counter. I still needed to message the order about the nether worm banishment, and I had a satchel full of student papers to grade, but with Kayla's shadow taken care of, I felt a sudden urge to address mine, namely the one extending from my neglected mail pile. As I began to sort through the parcels, I looked over at Tabitha again. Something made me pause this time. I'd fed her well in the past, but she'd never smiled for this long. I hadn't even thought her capable. Wait a second, I murmured, opening my wizard's senses. And that's when I saw what was really going on. The room sharpened back in my vision as I marched toward her. By the time I arrived at her divan, my heart was thumping behind my eyeballs. I was so angry. What? She murmured, squinting up. You took a bite out of Flick's soul is what? And? She asked languidly. He hasn't been able to get out of bed for two days. So you scold me for just lying there when he was attacking you, and now you scold me for doing something? She released a sigh that would have sounded beleaguered if she wasn't so stuffed with steaks and soul. Instead, it came out a gratified purr. Oh, make up your mind, Dar. La! I'd lifted the pet carrier from beside the divan and shoved her inside. What are you doing? She demanded from behind the mesh door. Taking you back so you can return that. Her eyes turned pitiful. Have you no heart? As I fetched my keys and cane, I shook my head bitterly. And here I was, starting to think her help at the club had stemmed from a growing bond between us. But no, she'd been playing the long con, taming my vigilance and then making her move while the rest of us slept. But by the time I stepped out under the just illuminating streetlights, I'd calmed down enough to wonder if I was being too hard on her. She was a succubus, after all, and I was starting to see the poetic justice in one manipulator feeding off another. Even so, I probably could have done more to keep the carrier from jostling as I ran to catch up to Kayla. D -d 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 Damn you to hell, she managed. Love you too, Tabby. Thanks for listening to Suck It Up the third in the Croft and Tabby series. If you enjoyed this story, please like and comment to let us know. And don't forget to subscribe for more audiobooks set in the Croftverse. For Everson Croft's backstory, and to learn how he and Tabitha met, be sure to check out the Prof Croft prequels, also available on this channel. When you're ready for the main series, the 32-hour Prof Croft box set is now on Audible. Suck It Up, a Croft and Tabby short, was written by Brad Magnarella. Narrated by James Patrick Cronin, a member of SAG-AFTRA. Post-production by Mike Strasa. Copyright 2023 by Brad Magnarella. Production copyright 2023 by Brad Magnarella.